you're going to be a comedian? Comedy seemed like something that wouldn't require great intelligence. Comedy seemed like something that wouldn't require great intelligence. You gotta do better than that. T-Comic, how you do it? Are you guys ready to party? Laugh, 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 laugh. Glad to be here. Folks, I gotta tell you, really, the only reason I'm here is because recently uh, a job application of mine was declined by Acorn, so... <laughs> To be fair, I did show up to the job interview dressed as a prostitute. Laugh, 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 laugh. Allegory, a story where the characters stand for abstract ideas. For example, good and evil. Cause I was Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde, Hyde, Jekyll. Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde. Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde, Hyde, Jekyll. Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde. Mr. Hyde rearing his ugly bisexual head. That was a sm that was a short face. It was pure allegory. Today's video calls for the cancel me daddy candle. Let's light the candle before we begin. Crowder has always been a bit of an enigma. He's a proud resident of Texas who preaches the power of U.S. American exceptionalism, and yet he's also Canadian. He hosts a show called Change My Mind, and yet has remained firmly steadfast in his positions for the entirety of his career as a commentator. He calls himself pro-life and claims to want to protect unborn babies, yet has also been caught on camera smoking in front of his pregnant wife. He dislikes the LGBTQ community and the ability for people to be respected for how they identify, and yet he identifies as a comedian, despite not being biologically funny. I have to name this guy the sexiest man in America, Barack Obama by People Magazine. Really? <laughs> the sexiest man in America? Let's give that to Hugh Jackman, not the guy who looks like the photo negative of Alfred E. Newman, okay? <laughs> His media career began when he played The Brain on the hit animated show Arthur. And yet, whether Steven himself actually has a brain... What would you think of me if I ever got anything wrong? For years now, Steven Crowder has been a controversial figure, even going so far as to get himself permanently demonetized on his nearly 6 million subscriber YouTube channel, after which he grew his following on alternate video site Rumble, along with profiting off of his merch sales, memberships, and more, the way many of us online commentators do. Despite Steven's long career of bullying LGBTQ people online, while also regularly dressing up as a woman himself, yeah! He's maintained a strong, loyal fan base of people who believe that Steven really isn't such a bad guy. After all, he's not really bullying people who are different from him because he actually hates them. Is that so? He's just joking. He's a comedian. And more than that, he's a warrior for free speech. When he makes mean, lazy, half jokes at other people's expense, it's not bullying. The joke is in the very fact that he's pushing the boundaries of free speech in the first place. He's just making a statement about how far free speech should extend. He's edgy. He's irresistibly taboo. He's like the violent video game that your mom doesn't want you to have. He's the cool kid. He's done. He's done. Steven Crowder is done. His career is over. About a week ago, at the end of April 2023, even the most loyal of Crowder's fans have left him behind. Longtime subscribers of his, known as the Mug Club, after the Louder with Crowder mug merch that he sends them, have left in droves claiming that he's now finally crossed the line. Bet you didn't expect to hear MLK and crack whores. I have a dream of non-crack whores at a Motel 6. And to be fair, he has. Now, a lot of us have pointed out that Steven's been crossing every line for a very long time, but since Steven never seems to run out of lines to cross, yes, he has crossed a line once again. It all began when, in April 2023, Steven posted a video addressing his in-progress divorce from his wife, Hillary, to whom he'd been married for more than a decade. In this video, Steven explained that he didn't want a divorce and that his wife was choosing to leave him. However, the way he framed this discussion was kind of interesting. This was not uh, my choice. My then wife decided that she didn't want to be married anymore. And in the state of Texas, that is completely permitted. 
Yes, Steven Crowder posted a video being butthurt that the government allows a woman to leave him. Let me know in the comments below which is a bigger self-own. Ben Shapiro assuring us that his doctor wife assured him that women never get wet during sex unless they have something medically wrong, or Stephen going all surprised Pikachu on the state of Texas for allowing women to divorce him. Stephen, you've done it. You've officially surpassed Ben Shapiro in the world of disappointing women. I said certified freak seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pullout game weak. At least wet ass P word gate was hilarious. But Steven's situation is far from funny. After being utterly shocked that the law can't force women to be with him, Steven was shortly after exposed for abusive behavior toward his wife when a video circulated of him berating and threatening her while she was eight months pregnant and trying to de-escalate the situation. Steven, Steven, you're Watch it. Shortly after that, an article came out detailing allegations of abuse from a variety of Stevens' employees. The criticism wouldn't stop. Was this the beginning of the end for Steven Crowder? Well, did it really begin then? No, Stephen's patterns of abuse and bullying began a long, long time ago. Stephen Crowder has been this way for his entire career, and all the red flags were right there in front of us. So today, we're going to take a deep dive into the trajectory of Stephen Crowder. His career, his controversies, his victories, and in the end, his downfall. This is The Downfall of Stephen Crowder, a conservative cyberbully. Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. Hey, what's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy, and welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business, where today we are going to be talking about someone that we've covered a couple times in the past, once when I was reviewing his book, and once when I was detailing a business dealing gone wrong between him and The Daily Wire, and that is Steven Crowder. But before we get too deep into it, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, because multiple times a week I put out new videos for you guys, and you won't want to miss them, so don't forget to ring that little notification bell. And while we're at it, don't forget that today's video was brought to you by my Patreon supporters. Patreon supporters' names are up on the screen, and if you want to take a look in the description below, you can see my Patreon supporters who give $5 a month and up, where the reward for that tier is to be able to link a website or small business or social media page of your own in my description below and promote that. So go ahead and check that out as well. And if you're interested in getting more behind-the-scenes looks of what I do as a business owner, interviews with other authors, sneak peeks of upcoming books I have coming out, of which there are at least two I've been posting over there. So if you want to get all of that kind of stuff along with more personal blog posts and things about my life and what I do and my process as a business owner and all of that, then you can check out my Patreon page, which is linked in the description below. Thank you so much. Let's get into the topic. Let's actually begin at the beginning. How did Steven Crowder first come to be? Steven Crowder was born in Michigan in 1987. Although, as Steven will remind you over and over and over again, he's not really from Michigan, he's from... Of course, uh, I, I did grow up in Canada. But I'm like, whoa, man, I am from... Canada? And you know what? That's fair. Steven didn't actually grow up in Michigan. Steven's mother was French Canadian. And so when Steven was three years old, she moved with him back to Quebec, where he spent the rest of his childhood until moving to the US at 18 to attend college in Vermont. But it was during his Canadian childhood, during his years of growing up in the land of house hippos and ketchup chips, that Steven's media career truly began. Don't you put it in your mouth. At age 12, Steven took his first major acting role. And if you didn't know this about the start of Steven Crowder's career, this is gonna blow your mind. Steven Crowder got his start in voice acting, specifically on the animated show Arthur, where he played Arthur's nerdy friend Alan, who went by the nickname The Brain. Well, now that things have changed, I need to be practical and train myself for a new career in comedy. Now, the show Arthur ran for more than two decades, and Steven didn't voice Brain that entire time. Rather, he specifically worked on seasons five and six of Arthur, which means we have some excellent clips of Steven predicting his own future. For example, here's one episode where the Brain, voiced by Steven Crowder, decides that he wants to become a comedian. So he starts practicing his jokes. Excuse me, but if I want slop, I can read Ogleberg's treatise on binomial coefficients. Laugh, 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 laugh. And these jokes are about as solid as Stephen's actual comedy. Watch this. 
I just smashed an atom. Steven's most famous episode of Arthur is probably the one where the brain checks out the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde book from the library, only to become so encapsulated in the book that he can't stop dreaming about turning evil. <laughs> Which was also pretty telling, considering that Steven still understands the danger of his Jekyll and Hyde personas to this day. Mr. Hyde rearing his ugly bisexual head. That was a sm that was a short face. The woke literature in the brain school library indoctrinated him into growing up to become Steven Crowder. This is why we need to ban books. Parents, do you want your children reading about Jekyll and Hyde and then growing up to have a Mr. Hyde side of their own? When Steven was 17, he began performing stand-up comedy and in 2009, when he was about 22 years old, Steven began using his comedy skills to create conservative satire videos that he posted online. From there, Stephen began working for giant right-leaning media company Fox News, which he was let go of in 2013 for creative differences. His cancellation at Fox News began in 2012, and let's just read this Daily Beast article from 2013. That's now 10 years ago. I think this article sums up the conflicts at Fox News better than I personally could. Steven Crowder is always playing defense, whether it's against union thugs in Michigan, anonymous liberals on Twitter, or, most recently, his now former employer at Fox News, Crowder has had his guard up ever since he was a bullied middle schooler in Canada. <laughs> Fox News is mum about why the 26-year-old conservative comedian lost his contributor contract with the network, but luckily for Crowder, not being ready for primetime doesn't mean his career is over. He's carved out a niche in conservative subculture largely unknown to those outside the movement. If only this article knew what was coming. If you haven't heard of Crowder, you're not alone. Before being scooped up by Fox News in 2009, his main stage was YouTube. Despite identifying himself primarily as an actor and comedian, his most recognizable role was a run as the voice of the brain on the PBS kids series Arthur. But in the past eight years, the 26-year-old Canadian transplant went from self-producing politically charged YouTube videos to appearing regularly on Fox News and writing a semi-regular column on foxnews.com on topics like the benefits of abstinence and his own premarital virginity. By the time he emceed this year's conservative political action conference, CPAC, it seemed like Crowder was on his way to becoming a mainstream conservative pundit. I'm glad that other people think Steven Crowder being Canadian is funny too. I'm glad that that's something everyone can laugh at. But last week, after months of radio silence, Crowder laid into Fox News host Sean Hannity and Fox News in general during an interview with Hot Air's Ed Morrissey accusing Kennedy of kowtowing to liberals like Anthony Weiner and Michael Moore while adding complaints about his difficulty negotiating a new Fox contract. It was a strange way to resurface nearly seven months after his last television appearance. The next day, he posted a lengthy apology to Hannity on his Facebook page with no mention of his broader Fox bashing. But it was too late. Breitbart.com reported that Crowder had been canned, quoting a senior Fox employee saying that he was never that funny and crossed a line more than a few times. A spokesperson from Fox News confirmed to the Daily Beast that his contract would not be renewed. And finally, here is my favorite part of the Daily Beast article about Stephen's departure from Fox News. Despite his career as a polemicist, Crowder doesn't identify as a political person or even a Republican. I'm a cultural person, he says, often presenting himself instead as a comedian and actor. Well, too bad, Steven. Just because you identify as a comedian doesn't mean you're biologically funny, and it doesn't mean that I want you in my funny spaces where I feel unsafe around your groan-worthy jokes. The article continues regarding Steven's identity. <laughs> Nor does he identify with most people his age, assuming, as he has throughout his life, that most of his peers hate him. Even when I told him I was a huge fan of Arthur, he assumed I meant that I no longer liked the show after discovering his tenure as the brain. So Steven Crowder is very much not like other girls, which is funny considering he's literally Gretchen Wieners after she snaps. You should totally just stab Caesar! Dave Rubin is Gretchen Wieners before she snaps, but we'll get into that later. Steven's relationship with Fox must have been mended enough somewhere along the way because in 2015, in addition to writing an opinion column for Fox about the powers of abstinence, he published an article to their site about why he's so happy that he waited until marriage to have sex. Here are some highlights from that article. Let me preface this column by saying this. My wife, I still have to get used to saying that, and I not only waited sexually in every way, no, we didn't pull the Bill Clinton and technically avoid sex, sex sex, but we didn't shack up as live-ins, and most importantly, we courted each other in a way that was consistent with our publicly professed values. We did it right. 
Well, there's one thing that Stephen and I can agree on here, and that's that yeah, Bill Clinton was a fucking liar. Now, I just want to make something clear. I believe that every individual person is entitled to their own sexual boundaries that they decide for themselves. If someone wants to wait until marriage for sex, that's their choice and we should respect that. Similarly, if someone wants to have a lot of sex but never get married, that's also their choice. Again, I'm a proud American who believes in freedom for all. So there's nothing wrong with Steven Crowder choosing to remain abstinent outside of marriage. That's his choice. It's not a choice that I made, but it's a choice that he has every right to. The part that bothers me is when he's saying that he did it right, that there's one right way to approach romantic or sexual relationships and Steven's way is obviously the right way and if you don't do it his way, you're wrong. No, I will not make out with you. <laughs> that's not up to you, Steven, and that's not a very freedom-oriented way to behave. Feeling judged? I couldn't care less. You know why? Because my wife and I were judged all throughout a relationship. People laughed, scoffed, and poked fun at the young, celibate, naive Christian couple. We'd certainly never make it to the wedding without stopping. And if we did, our wedding night would be awkward and terrible, they said. Turns out people couldn't have been more wrong. Looking back, I think that the women saying those things felt like the floozies they ultimately were. And the men with their fickle manhood tied to their pathetic sexual conquests felt threatened. I think it's important to write this column not to gloat, though I'll be glad to, but to speak up for all the young couples that have also done things the right way. When people do marriage right, they don't complain so much, and so their voices are silenced by the rabble of promiscuous charlatans peddling their pathetic worldview as progressive. This man was paid by a giant media company to write this. To write, they don't complain, so where's the sources, Stephen? Please, sir, can I have a source? So let me reiterate. If others judge Stephen for waiting till marriage, that's wrong. Those are his personal sexual preferences and boundaries, and as a human being with bodily autonomy, he is entitled to those. But at the same time, it's not right to then turn around and judge other people for making a different choice. Choosing to have sex outside of marriage does not make one a promiscuous charlatan as Stephen so pretentiously puts it. For many, sexual compatibility is extremely important in a relationship, and whether or not a couple is sexually compatible is something that couple wants to figure out before making a legally binding commitment to that person. My point is, relationships are different for different people, and that's fine. Here's what Stephen has to say about the morning after his wedding. As my wife, again, still not used to that, and I ate breakfast at a local inn, we discussed how excited we were to start the rest of our lives together. Well, Stephen, that was 10 years ago, and she no longer feels the same way about the whole rest of your lives thing, so we'll get to that. That's what we call irony. And you know what you can make out of irony? Jokes! Comedy! See, Stephen's life itself is more of a comedy than the actual jokes he makes on stage, and I truly think that's beautiful. Stephen has become part of a growing demographic of people that I call the failed comedian to political commentator pipeline. Darn sh it's always giving me problems with them. That's the last time I drive a Chevy. We see this a lot. Someone wants to make it as a comedian, or an actor, or a writer, or an entertainer of some sort, but usually a comedian. But it turns out they're just not that good at stand-up comedy, and so they fail, and they don't have any fans, and nobody cares. But then, they realize there's another way to get attention. By being inflammatory and obnoxious and calling it comedy. And the biggest way to rile people up is to claim that you're pursuing entertainment in the name of truth. So they become political commentators. They become people who say, I'm here to bring some much needed humor to the serious issues of the world. Which honestly isn't a terrible idea on its own. Making the news digestible and being willing to cope with tragedy with humor, those aren't bad things in a vacuum. But when you had no real talent as a comedian in the first place and all you had were offensive opinions that you say really loudly, that's when the world of Ben Shapiro's decides that you're the funniest person they've ever met. See also Dave Rubin. I've done at least two videos on Dave Rubin before, and he's another example of this pipeline. Maybe I'll do a whole video one day on the failed comedian to political commentator pipeline. Let me know if you want that. But it is safe to say that Steven Crowder found way more success as a conservative commentator than he ever did as a run-of-the-mill stand-up comedian. In 2017, Steven began producing content for CRTV, a streaming service run by the Conservative Review, which later merged with The Blaze, a company run by Glenn Beck. 
back. Steven's video content was also posted to his personal YouTube channel, where he gained millions of subscribers. One of the segments that's a regular part of Steven's work is a show called Change My Mind, which many of you have probably heard of due to its long-standing place in the meme world. In 2018, Steven Crowder went viral the way many people in 2018 went viral, as a meme. Steven Crowder had begun hosting a segment on YouTube called Change My Mind. The show followed Steven as he visited various college campuses throughout the US, set up a sign with a summary of one of his more controversial beliefs, and then invited students walking by to try to change his mind. Steven's camera operator would record while students sat down with Steven and debated various issues such as feminism, LGBTQ rights, and more. In February of 2018, he visited Texas Christian University where he set up a sign reading, Male privilege is a myth. Change my mind. The photo of Steven on campus went viral not because of any interesting discussions had throughout his visit, but because of how great the photo made for a meme template. Just swap out male privilege as a myth with literally any other opinion and you have the perfect reaction image for every situation. Now guys, let's heed the candles warning. Don't cancel me daddy. But I have something I need to say here. When I first came across this show about five years ago, at first, I actually kind of thought it was a decent idea. I tried watching a few episodes of Change My Mind. I wanted to see how people actually engaged with one another in these moments. I wanted to see how these college students would challenge Steven's worldview and how he would respond. And as an arrogant little bitch in my 20s, I started wishing I could go on Change My Mind. I wanted to debate Steven myself. My millennial hubris had convinced me that I could be the one to change Steven's mind. I was watching all these episodes and no one had changed Steven's mind yet, but none of their arguments were that good, at least not from what I saw on the camera. I could think of so many more things I would say, so many more sources I would bring up, so many more arguments I would make, and those would be the arguments that would finally convince Steven that I, as a woman, as a gay, as a gay-ass woman, that I deserve rights. Right? Well, that was before I stopped and really thought about it. If Steven was interviewing this many people and he was never changing his mind, what could be going wrong? It couldn't be that Steven was just right about literally everything. And it also couldn't be that every single college student was a complete idiot. At the very least, those two things are highly unlikely to both be true in every single situation. So what was it? Well, first of all, there's the editing. There's the fact that while Steven does sometimes play full discussions all the way through, his videos are edited. They don't just live stream the entire day he's on campus. On top of that, there's the fact that Steven has home field advantage. Maybe it doesn't seem that way since he's literally on these college students' literal home turf, but he's the one who sets up the interviews. He's the one who chooses the topics. He's the one who comes prepared with all his sources while the students are caught by surprise on their way to class without the same time to prepare like they would in a formal debate. Steven doesn't like it when the tables are turned on him in this direction. He doesn't want to be the one debating when he doesn't have the advantage of preparing it all ahead of time, of knowing exactly what he's up against. In June 2021, Steven Crowder challenged YouTuber and podcaster Ethan Klein, host of the channel H3, to a debate about the science behind the COVID-19 virus. Steven referred to Ethan as a layup, meaning he thought it would be an easy win. After all, Steven knows he's on the right side of history about COVID, Right? It couldn't have anything to do with the fact that he thinks Ethan isn't very smart or isn't very good at debating and would therefore be easy to manipulate into winning. No, he didn't want to debate him because of the person he is. He wanted to debate the issue itself, right? No, of course not. See, during this debate, Ethan pulled a little bait and switch with Steven. This all started a while back when, at a political event, Steven Crowder backed out of a debate with Sam Cedar, host of the show The Majority Report, which reports news from a more left-leaning angle. So when it came time for Ethan to debate Steven on stream, Ethan surprised Steven by bringing Sam Cedar on as a guest to debate Crowder in his place. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, oh, what a fucking nightmare. You, Steven. Now, I can understand why Ethan did this. After all, Ethan himself said that he isn't a debater. He doesn't do debates, but Sam does. Wouldn't it make sense for two people who both make content in the political arena, who both do debates in the first place, to be the ones to have the debate, rather than Ethan, someone who admits he wouldn't be very good at it? Did Steven really want to have an honest, potentially mind-changing discussion about COVID? 
Or did he just want an easy win? Well, as it turned out, it was the latter. When Sam Cedar appeared on stream, Stephen rage quit the debate, refusing to continue the discussion. You <laughs> run away twice, cold feet again. He cited his reason as being that Ethan had lied to him and he didn't want to participate in a stream that was scheduled based on a lie. And just to be clear, I really didn't like that Ethan did this either. I really do wish that he'd been honest about the terms of the debate. I wish he hadn't tricked Steven. I also wish that Ethan had been willing to participate in the debate itself. Even if debating isn't Ethan's forte, I do think it's important to be able to defend your positions when they're held up to scrutiny. And let's be real, he did agree to have the debate. So I'm not proud of Ethan in this situation either. But at the same time, I wish Steven had stayed for the debate as well. And I wish Steven had understood the hypocrisy of running away from a debate just because he he wasn't prepared for the situation, but also thinking that dunking on college kids in between classes is truly an effective or intellectually honest way to have a discussion. At the end of the day, if it really is all about the issues, if it really is all about having an honest and intelligent discussion and opening each other's minds up to new ideas, then why should it matter to Steven if it's Ethan or Sam that he's having the discussion with? Situations like these made it clearer and clearer as time went on that Steven Crowder's Change My Mind show was that in name only. He did not ever want to have his mind changed. He wanted to change other people's minds and to always come out looking victorious. And if anything ever challenged that, he wanted no part of it. Still, I can see the value in sitting down with people and having long-form discussions where you fully break down your opinions, share your sources, explain your viewpoints, talk about where you're coming from, and spend time addressing each other's concerns directly rather than addressing the version of their concern that you made up in your mind. It's usually not helpful to ascribe motivations to other people because we're not mind readers, and more often than not, it's likely we'll get someone else's motivations wrong. I tend to be kind of idealistic, and I like to believe that most people are honest about their intentions, that most people are just trying to live their own lives rather than make others miserable, even if others' misery does come as an externality. So that's all to say that for the majority of my life, I've been a fan of debate, and I have gone out of my way to listen to those who disagree with me, and at the very least to understand. Of course, though, my mind is open to change, unlike Stevens. And because of that, fairly recently, my mind actually has been changed. Not by Steven Crowder, by another YouTuber. YouTuber, one that I actually like, a YouTuber named ContraPoints, whose new video, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, delved into the ways we frame debates and discussions when we're in conversation with someone who's our ideological opposite. In this video, Natalie breaks down the ways that debate isn't always productive in every situation. How sometimes even engaging in an argument in the first place is an acknowledgement that the Overton window even encapsulates that viewpoint in the first place. Like, for example, very few people would even spend time debating whether the US should replace the presidency with a king or a monarch. Why? Because that's not something that a significant group of people are actually considering. Most of us wouldn't spend time in an argument with a flat earther because most of us know that the earth isn't flat. Because most of us know that the flat that earth concept isn't something we're even entertaining. It's not a real debate, it's a question that's long been answered, end of story. So while I do still believe in the power of discussion, I have recently come to realize that sometimes you have to know when to quit. When I meet people whom I truly believe are arguing in good faith, people who seem to share similar values to mine in the sense of we agree on an ideal world of equality for all, but their beliefs may diverge and that they have different ideas on how to achieve that or different like systemic ideas on the actual practicality of those things. Maybe as a result of us sharing different life circumstances or a different education that leads us to see the world differently. In those cases, yes, I want to discuss things with them. I want to understand where people who think differently from me are coming from. Otherwise, all that'll be left are the straw men I construct when I imagine what their reasoning is rather than just asking them. But there are some people who go too far. Like two years ago when I debated some red pill guys, that was a mistake. Like my tattoo right here says it was a huge mistake and also great for views, which is a quote from an absolutely remarkable thing by Hank Green. Great book, by the way. Anyway, that was a debate with people who didn't share a similar idea for what they eventually wanted the world to look like. We had completely different views and outcomes. And as a result, our debates broke down even on the very level of the language we were using. That kind of thing wasn't productive. So at 
the end of the day, Steven's Change My Mind show hasn't had the focus on intellectual honesty that it really seems to present itself as having. And because of that, the show just ends up being cheap entertainment rather than something with any actual productive value or impact on the world. Now in this next section, I'm going to delve into Steven's biggest hit show, Louder with Crowder, which he's broadcast on YouTube, Rumble, and a variety of other media platforms for years. Be warned going into this that I will be playing some clips of Steven's worst, meanest moments on the show, which means that you may hear him saying a lot of extremely racist, extremely sexist, and violent, extremely anti-LGBTQ things. If you'd rather not hear all of that, you can skip to the timestamp on the screen. So let's jump into the worst of it. First, let's just rip off the band-aid. Here's the kind of stuff Steven says on his show, louder with Crowder. Wouldn't it stand to reason that the victims of rape would usually, not always, generally be those who are most desirable sexually, considering the crime? Maybe like the fives to tens. I mean, like you don't carjack a 98 Oldsmobile. No. <laughs> and this, <laughs> and it's no. always ladies like that who are claiming they're raped. I've searched, and I could be wrong about this, mm -hmm. There are many, right? How many times have I been to a change of my mind? It's always a blue haired, would be lesbian feminist who claim they're raped. As far as I know, not one Victoria's Secret model has been raped. In addition to his strange views on women, Stephen has said the following about transgender people and the surgeries that they get. Some kind of mental proclivity toward extreme behavior, and I don't think it's helping people yeah. to simply enable it. I don't want, I don't want 42% of transgenders. 41%, depending on the stat you use. It's right in there. It's very rare that you get multiple studies that come in in that 41, 42%. Like they're all like within yeah. a point of each other, pre op and post op. I don't want nearly half of all transgenders to attempt suicide. I want that to be lower. Guess what doesn't work? You saying, you're all good. You're a woman. It doesn't help. It yeah. makes it worse. And it makes it potentially Ow. slightly worse. People are afraid to study it, but we know at least one percentage worse, which really is statistically insignificant if you go through the surgery. So first, the discussion about the rate of people ending their lives. That's an interesting correlation doesn't equal causation fallacy you're employing there, bro. Has Steven ever considered that one of the reasons many people who are in these marginalized demographics may end up having mental health issues could be due to people like Steven intentionally bullying them to his millions of followers and constantly trying to make their lives miserable. Unfortunately, we also have examples of people who are long time transgenders yeah. who lived as such, and they're also much more likely to commit sex crimes. It seems like- Couldn't be that though. Also his whole point about they can't achieve pleasure in sex anymore. I think when you say you're transgender, and now we're gonna give you the surgery, which may make it impossible for you to ever achieve sexual climax again, I, I would, I would, I'd off myself. Steven, the fact that you think you can't have an orgasm without a penis is very telling. Let's remind everyone, your wife left you, bro. Anyway, this isn't even true in the first place, even for trans people. According to the health department at the University of Utah, many trans feminine people wonder if they'll still be able to have orgasms after having a vaginoplasty. Your surgeon will use skin from your penis to create a clitoris. This clitoris still has feeling and most transgender women can have orgasm through clitoral stimulation. So not only is Steven bad at sex, he's just objectively wrong. In 2019, Steven Crowder's YouTube channel was permanently demonetized for LGBTQ hate speech. At first, the ban wasn't supposed to be permanent, but of course, Steven Crowder couldn't stop being Steven Crowder, so four years later, yes, he's still banned. Here's what happened. Carlos Maza, a reporter from Vox, gathered examples of Crowder using homophobic language on his show. YouTube then temporarily suspended Crowder's monetization, claiming they'd bring it back if he removed those offending videos from his channel, along with ceasing advertisement of his merch that contained homophobic slurs on it. In August 2020, like a year later, Steven finally complied with YouTube's request and his monetization status was returned for that moment. Just a few months later, in March 2021, YouTube once again suspended Crowder's monetization, this time citing his spread of misinformation about the 2020 election results and the impacts of the COVID-19 virus as the reasons. But like the little special snowflake that Steven is, he decided to play the victim in this scenario. When he addressed the situation on his Instagram, he said the following. 
I've been warning you about this for a long time, and now it's here. Big tech, specifically YouTube, have painted a target on conservatives' backs for years, with yours truly being target number one. Today, Google slash YouTube just fired a huge shot across our bow. They are no longer enforcing community guidelines, but creating entirely new ones with the express purpose of removing any and all conservative voices of dissent. And for the crime of investigative journalism, we are forbidden from uploading, posting, or live streaming for an entire week on the main channel. Don't worry, we've got something for them, smiley face. What's so funny about this is that what YouTube was doing in this situation was extremely capitalist of them. Steven should like that, theoretically. YouTube is a site where advertisers pay to have their products promoted before content that viewers watch. If an advertiser thinks that the content is offensive or inaccurate or harmful to their customer base, it's not in their best interest to advertise on that video. Therefore, the more videos that YouTube allows to be monetized while being non-advertiser friendly according to their standards, the more money YouTube as a company will lose. Look, I'm not saying I like this system. I've gotten videos demonetized for stupid ass reasons before, and I'm not a fan of the way that this system works as a whole. But it is a capitalist approach. It's letting the free market decide. And the free market decided that it didn't like paying Steven Crowder to advertise on his videos. At some point, if that's going to be the way that you make money, you're going to have to adjust your behavior to the market. It's not about censorship, it's about being a smart businessman. The same idea is going to come back in just a bit when Steven has a big falling out with his former bestie Ben Shapiro over a Daily Wire contract. I love the smell of commerce in the morning. Like I said, Steven is Gretchen Wieners after she cracks, and Ben Shapiro is Regina George, no question. You should totally just stab Caesar! There's a lot of things we could call Steven Crowder. A douchebag, sure. A bully, absolutely. But a quitter, never. Steven wasn't going to bow to YouTube's corporate overlords. Instead, he'd become worse. He'd become even more annoying. And more than that, he'd become even more racist. The Louder with Crowder show has long been a place for racist humor. I say humor in quotes because the racist part is there, but the joke part usually isn't. Like, here, I'm gonna give an example of why this does work as racism, but doesn't work as a joke. For example, let's compare these two clips. Here is a clip of Steven Crowder doing a racist impression of Barack Obama. Most happy about the new policy, these people. So, yeah. I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy a plow, man. I'm gonna plant that corn. <laughs> Go get a John Deere. Barack Obama, mother, I'm the president of plowing that ad. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was that? Now, for anyone in the comments who want to say, oh my god, you leftists are so easily offended, that's an obvious joke, that's not real racism, let me explain why that's not the case. You can do something similar to this as a joke and have the joke land. The issue is within the context of the joke itself. The context is that here Steven truly means what he's saying. I'll show you what I mean. Let's compare that clip we just watched of Steven's racist rant masked as a joke to an actual joke of a very similar type of thing from the show It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Hey, yo, what up, son? What's up with Congress being all up in my ass and shit, bro? Oh, oh my God, dude. That, that was what are you doing? What? so racist. Are you kidding me? Very racist. Awful. Deandra, he is the president of that the United the States. That's our president. Well, hold on a second. Does it make sense to you how most people would consider the clip from It's Always Sunny to be a joke? but Steven Crowder's clip to be just racist. In Steven's clip, he's mocking someone by impersonating a racial stereotype. The context of the clip, the reason he went on this rant in the first place, is that Steven's explaining why he thinks it's dumb that a recent government subsidy given out to farmers, that black farmers were given half of that subsidy allotment from the government. So Steven's joke here is that he doesn't want black farmers to have the same amount of money as white farmers, and then he does a very inaccurate impression of a black president. The entire setup is a mess and there is no payoff other than just, look, racism. I guess you could laugh at it if the only thing you laugh at is pure shock value, which I get it. I think the funniest thing in the world is when someone just unexpectedly screams in my face that gets me every time. But to call it a joke 
that has any clever elements to it or that most people would find funny or entertaining is a massive stretch. To call it regular racism just seems more accurate. Meanwhile, the clip from It's Always Sunny has the context that, first of all, these characters are all awful people that you want to hate. The additional context here is that Dee, the character who's doing the impression, considers herself to be an actress, and a regular theme on the show is how badly she fails in pursuing her acting career. The joke is that Dee thinks she's doing a good job at acting, but everyone else just sees her as being racist, which is also funny in the context of the show, because all the other characters in the show are racist as well, but by getting mad at her for this, they're commenting on the way that they get offended when the racism becomes too obvious and too overt. Basically, humor exists within context, just like everything in life. Steven Crowder making racist jokes never really feels funny, because Steven Crowder himself actually believes those racist things. He's not parodying the beliefs. He's not trying to draw attention to how ridiculous they are. He really believes them, so the humor is lost. But Steven's racist failures go far, far beyond his inability to tell jokes. And this is the reason that offensive humor doesn't work for Steven. We know he's not actually joking because of his continued racist behavior. Let's take a look at an even more egregious example. In April of 2021, a little over two years ago, Steven Crowder landed himself in serious controversy due to the video he created for his show, Louder with Crowder, about the murder of George Floyd. I'm not going to show clips of this because it's really horrifying to look at and it'll definitely get this video restricted, but you can Google it. It happened. The video's out there. I've also linked all my sources for this in the description below. So first, let's have a little context. On May 25th, 2020, a man named George Floyd was murdered by a police officer named Derek Chauvin. During Floyd's arrest over a counterfeit $20 bill, Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck for nine straight minutes, causing Floyd to die of asphyxiation. Floyd's death led to an eruption of protests against police brutality throughout the U.S. with a focus on the ways that police brutality disproportionately affects Black Americans. So, Fast forward about a year. It's now the spring of 2021, the time when Derek Chauvin is actively on trial for this murder. Steven Crowder decides that this is a great idea for him to turn into content, and not just content and entertainment for his show, but a sketch recreating the murder. See, Steven Crowder was convinced of Derek Chauvin's innocence. Why? I don't know. Chauvin was eventually found guilty of the murder, and one of the reasons that this specific case of police brutality was so high profile is that there was video evidence documenting the entire thing. Video footage taken on a bystander cell phone showed Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck for nine consecutive minutes, refusing to get up even as Floyd and others begged him to stop, even as Chauvin was repeatedly informed again and again that Floyd was going to die if he kept it up. But for some reason, Steven Crowder wasn't convinced. Or at the very least, it was profitable for Steven Crowder to side with the murderer in this case. Steven created a sketch for his channel where he recreated the scene of the murder. Steven took on the role of Floyd, lying on the concrete ground outside his studio, while an actor played the police officer and knelt on Steven's neck for nine minutes. After Steven survived the attack, that he himself orchestrated for the camera, he concluded that because he was fine afterwards, that Chauvin must have been innocent and Floyd must have died some other way, despite evidence to the contrary. Shortly after this video came out, political Twitch streamer Hassan Piker tweeted the following, Steven Crowder not attempting the actual knee on neck pressure that killed George Floyd is everything you need to know about how horrific and violent that process actually was. In the responses to this tweet, other users pointed out a variety of differences between the reenactment on Steven's channel and the actual murder that really happened. Basically, Steven didn't prove shit. For the majority of the video, the actor places his knee farther down Steven's body, applying most of the pressure to his upper back rather than to his actual neck. You can look up the video if you don't believe me. Again, I'm not showing it here. But of course, even after the backlash Steven received for this video, he wasn't ready to stop being a racist piece of trash just yet. For example, let's take a look at how Steven Crowder decided to celebrate Martin Luther King Day. Bet you didn't expect to hear MLK and crack whores. So in order to understand why this joke is racist, we must first ask ourselves a very important question. What is crack? 
Thankfully, in the year of our Lord 2023, we have access to the online version of Encyclopedia Britannica where we can look up what crack is. Here's what it says. Crack began to be produced in the early 1980s. The method is to dissolve cocaine hydrochloride into water with sodium bicarbonate baking soda, which precipitates solid masses of cocaine crystals. Basically, crack is a form of cocaine that did not exist until the early 1980s. Cocaine itself wasn't even a common drug in the U.S. until later in the 1960s, and the crack form of it didn't exist until the 80s. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968, years before most Americans had ever even thought about cocaine itself, and more than a decade before crack even came into existence. The drug known as crack did not exist in Martin Luther King's timeline. So why did Stephen think it made sense to bring up crack in the first place? Where is the joke here? I have a dream of nine crack holes at a Motel 6. There's no connection between the two. Unless the connection that Stephen is trying to get us to draw is Martin Luther King was black and the crack epidemic had a disproportionate effect on black communities in the U.S. during the 80s. So the joke is just, he's a black guy. That's not a joke, that's just racism! Regardless of Steven's lack of skill regarding comedy, some people still seem to think he's funny. One of those people is Ben Shapiro. Another one of those people is Jeremy Boring, Ben Shapiro's business partner for The Daily Wire, the media company that hosts Ben Shapiro's content. Because these guys, for some strange reason, seem to enjoy Steven Crowder as an entertainer, in early 2023, they offered him a $50 million contract to sign with them to become a Daily Wire employee and produce his show for their platform. I actually made an entire video about this potential contract and the business implications of it just a few months ago, back when this was all going down, so you can watch the full thing there if you want the complete story, but we will do a quick recap right now. Welcome to the political mean girls debacle! So as I've mentioned, we know that all the political commentary bros are mean girls. By that, I don't mean that they're literally girls. I mean it in the sense that people mean it when they say, I'm a Carrie or I'm a Samantha, whether referring to Sex in the City or to Samantha the American Girl doll. Or when people say like, I'm a Gryffindor. These guys can easily be compared to the main cast of Mean Girls. Ben Shapiro is, of course, Regina George, the leader of the pack, the one who everyone follows because for some strange reason they think he's cool and a trendsetter. Like Regina, Ben comes from a wealthy family, and like Regina, Ben is afraid of lesbians. I mean, I couldn't have a lesbian at my party. Gretchen Wieners depends on where in the movie we're talking about. If we're talking about early Gretchen, pre katie Heron Gretchen, that's Dave Rubin. Dave follows Ben Shapiro like a lost puppy, letting Ben bully and push him around, but claims through it all that they're still best friends. He lets Ben treat him like shit in the name of friendship because friendship with Ben is what leads to popularity, or in these guys' case, profit. And just like Gretchen Wieners got diarrhea at Barnes & Noble, Dave Rubin got diarrhea on Mount Sinai and wrote about it in graphic detail in his book Don't Burn This Book, which I reviewed on this channel in October 2021. Next is Karen, whose boobs can tell when it's raining. She's Tim Pool. Not very smart, but I bet Tim Pool's beanie can tell when it's raining. Katie Heron is Joe Rogan, someone who pretends to infiltrate the Mean Girls group just to troll them, but in the end becomes one of them. Jordan Peterson is Aaron Samuels, shit at math but still gets into a good college at the end, plus Plus, all the mean girls are simping hard for his approval and want to call him daddy. And finally, Gretchen Wieners after the movie's midpoint. Gretchen when she's finally ready to destroy Regina. You should totally just stab Caesar! That Gretchen is Steven Crowder. Always trying so hard to make fetch happen and ready to stand up to the queen bee. In early 2023, The Daily Wire offered Steven Crowder a $50 million contract to produce his show with them. Now, we all know that $50 million is a metric fuckload of money. However, we also need to keep in mind that $50 million was not Steven Crowder's yearly take-home salary. Rather, it was a four-year contract to acquire Steven's entire production team. So that means Steven would receive about $12.5 million per year, and with that money would then pay his staff of camera operators, video editors, sound engineers, what have you. Keeping all of that in mind, Steven's take-home pay would likely be in the single-digit millions, which, while not $50 million, that's still well, a metric fuckload of money. Steven turned down this contract, instead choosing to expose the terms of it on his show Louder with Crowder. Before you start trying to do some, some, some Sherlock Holmes work, um, there are far more people 
beneath the tip of the iceberg than you know about who are trying to get into the space. He used this time to leak recorded audio of his call with Jeremy Boring, who true to his name is a very boring guy. Let's say it's some other kid, you're paying, you're paying six figures to come in and do it. There's, there's not the penalty of the demonetization or if they're removed from iTunes, Apple, YouTube. Yeah, sure there would be. But why did Steven turn down this contract? Why did he pass up not only money, but the opportunity for good relations with the queen bees of conservative commentary? StopBigCon.com The popular girls of the millennial political arena. At StopBigCon.com why did he burn bridges with Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Jeremy Boring, Candace Owens, and all the rest of the Daily Wire team? StopBigCon.com According to Stephen, it was because of a clause in the contract that stated that while Stephen would retain creative control of his own content, being able to hire his own production team and write his own scripts and all that, if he were to get demonetized on YouTube, the Daily Wire was allowed to reduce his salary and reduce the amount of money paid to him in the contract. Heartbreaking. Worst person you know just made a great point. The person who made a great point in this case is once again not Steven Crowder. This time it was Ben Shapiro. The Daily Wire was right in this case. Ben Shapiro and his Daily Wire friends have been open from day one that they're free market capitalists above all else. Make more fucking money. They're business people and they're here to make money. And Steven Crowder, while a good entertainer, again, I can't claim to understand their taste, is also objectively a loose cannon. Let's Keep in mind that he got his ass demonetized on YouTube for the past four years, only being able to keep his monetization for a couple months at a time before YouTube takes it away from him once again. Basically, the Daily Wire guys didn't want Steven losing them money by getting every single video he made demonetized with election results conspiracy theories or homophobic slurs, because at the end of the day, they're there to run a business. But you never spend any money. You gotta start spending money. Money spending's good. Steven decided to make this into his own moral crusade, going on multiple rants on his channel about how he isn't in this for the money. He's in this for the future of our country. Kids, kids out there, coming up. We need to build a bench here in this movement. It's almost impossible. Don't sign, don't sign these contracts. How conservative media outlets only care about making money, but he truly cares about taking back the country from the woke leftists at any cost, even if it means he loses money. Great job, Steven. I'm sure your most diehard fans thought you looked like a martyr, but most people saw through this act as the publicity stunt that it was. StopBigCon.com Wow, Steven, you really exposed right-wing media outlets for wanting to make profit? It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. For understanding the capitalist system that they've been openly supporting since day one? Where's Surprise Pikachu? Surprise Pikachu uses free speech martyr. It's not very effective. So we've covered a lot about Steven Crowder's career as an actor, comedian, and broadcaster. But what about beyond that? Well, Steven Crowder does have one book out, and since I'm a book reviewer, you guys know I reviewed it on this channel. Toward the end of 2022, Steven Crowder released his first and only children's book, a picture book called Beautiful Differences, which tells the story of opposite gender twins who have different interests. It's a story, in quotes, because this book had no story. It was just Steven struggling really hard to stick to a rhyme scheme while saying nothing of note about the twins other than the fact that they enjoy playing and have parents and... Steven's a really shitty fiction writer, okay? The book was published by Brave Books, a company that exists solely to produce children's picture books written by right-wing conspiracy theorists. I'm not even kidding. I did an entire video about them. They've also published a book by Libs of TikTok. They've published a book by Kirk Cameron. The books feature exciting topics that kids love, like why the free market is better than socialism, the debate over centralized banks, and the importance of border control. I'm not even kidding, it's all right there on their website. You can take a look. Anyway, I did a whole hour long in-depth review of Steven's book in full, so you can check out that video if you want all the details. But I did still wanna talk about this book here because it's going to serve as a nice segue into our next topic, Steven's divorce. When Steven released Beautiful Differences, he had recently become a father. His twins, a boy and girl, were born in August, 2021, and Steven wrote this book throughout the year of 
of 2022, claiming he was inspired to write a story about twins after having twins of his own. Twins who are so very different as a boy and a girl. Twins who were barely a year old when the book was released, so of course Stephen knew a lot about their personalities and their interests, such as eating and sleeping and pooping and crying. So many beautiful differences. What none of us knew at the time was that this book released in the midst of Stephen's wife Hillary being in the process of leaving him. Uh, since 2021, I've been living through what has increasingly been a horrendous divorce. Hillary filed for separation from Stephen in 2021, a fact that he kept private from his audience. And that's fair. We're not entitled to every aspect of the man's personal life. However, now that we know what was going on behind the scenes, it does put some of the points he tried to make in this book into a strange context. Like, he regularly makes the point in this book that girls love talking all day and that girls never shut up. But when Stephen wrote this book, his actual daughter was too young to talk yet. So I'm not saying he was writing this book as a way to make passive-aggressive digs at his wife. I'm just saying that some people are saying that. And with all of that said, let's talk about Steven Crowder's wife. Or rather, his lack of a wife. Let's talk about the big news from the past few weeks, the news that has shaken up the conservative media world and set Steven Crowder's long career of cyberbullying on fire. Let's talk about Steven's divorce. On April 25th, 2023, Steven Crowder addressed that his wife Hillary was in the process of divorcing him on his show Louder with Crowder. He said the following. And no, this was not uh, my choice. My then wife decided that she didn't want to be married anymore. And in the state of Texas, that is completely permitted. That's right. The state of Texas allows that. Stephen is acting shocked that one person is allowed to divorce someone else, even if the other person wants to stay married. What's the alternative? That if you want to stay married, the law should force your wife to stay with you? No, that's not how this works. Marriage requires affirmative consent from both parties. If one party backs out of the contract, the contract is void. Now, before we continue this video, I'd like to give a warning that the remainder of the video will deal with topics of abuse, allegations of abuse, and if those topics aren't something that you're comfortable with hearing about right now, you may just want to turn off the video here. Viewer discretion is advised. So, fans were rightfully upset by Stephen's statement. It was odd to see Stephen hinting that a better law would allow him to stay married against his wife's will. Something was off, and it didn't take long to find what it was. Just two days later, on April 27th, 2023, a journalist named Yashar Ali posted a long Substack article leaking video footage of Stephen Crowder being a bit of a bad husband. No, you're not taking fun. You're this not taking the car. Steven. You are not taking the car. Then I will ask someone to pick me up. Would you like me to ask? Oh, that's right. It's not a threat, Steven. Get an Uber. Okay, Steven, I can't. D feeling some constraints? No, that doesn't work either. Or you'll be back when you're back. That doesn't work either. Steven. The only way out of it is discipline and respect. It's the only way out of it Steven. or we're at an impact. We are at an impact. Good. Because you can't have any discipline and respect. But Steven. Watch it. Sick. Hillary, you're right, right in the past. You just said I love you, I'm committed to that. Walk the dogs, crunch and gloves. Walk the dogs, crunch and gloves. Are you committed enough to do those things? Are you committed enough to do those things? Are you committed enough to do those things? Take that in. Take that in. Take that in. Take that in. So let's break this clip down. In the video, Stephen's wife is eight months pregnant with their twins. She's trying to take the car to go run errands, which Stephen agrees need to be done, like going to the grocery store. However, Stephen doesn't want her to leave because then he won't have access to the car. He'd rather her take an Uber so that the car is available should he want to leave. So a couple questions. Why does a couple living in a house like that only have one car? I won't speculate, but if you want to draw your own conclusions, I won't judge. Second, if Stephen wanted his wife to take an Uber to get groceries, then he's acknowledging the existence of transportation other than their own car. So if Stephen badly needed to leave the house while she was gone, 
couldn't he just take an Uber? And third, the most important question on my mind, why the fuck is Steven smoking around a woman who's eight months pregnant? Time and time again, Steven Crowder has claimed to be pro-life. He's against abortion rights, and he'll assure us that it's not because he wants to control women, but because he values the lives of the unborn. Well, two unborn lives are right there in front of you, bro. And they're the lives of your own children. And you're smoking around them. What? As many have pointed out, another point of note in this video is how hard Hillary is trying to de-escalate the situation. Reminding Stephen that she loves him, asking him to calm down, trying to leave the situation and take a break before the situation escalates. But Stephen won't let her. Because of course, it's women who are emotional and talk too much, right? Now, Stephen claims that this video was edited, that it was taken out of context. And I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, I'm not the jury, and I wasn't a witness. I don't have any special information about what happened in that moment. All I know is that it's a little hypocritical for Steven to complain about deceptive editing in videos when that's what he's been doing his entire career. Cutting up episodes of Change My Mind to showcase his best arguments rather than letting the entire day play out as an unedited live stream, selectively choosing which statistics about LGBTQ people to share without telling the complete story, grabbing clips here and there of his conversation conversation with Jeremy Boring to make himself look like the victim in a contract negotiation. All I'm saying is that Steven Crowder has never been someone with trustworthy views on deceptive video editing. But beyond this video itself, there's more to the story. Let's take a look at the full Substack article where this video was posted. Conservative media host and commentator Steven Crowder can be seen on a ring camera video berating his wife Hillary, who was at the time nearly eight months pregnant, and demanding that she handle medicine for his dogs that she was concerned was toxic to pregnant women. In the video, he snaps at her to put on her gloves to give his dogs medicine, walk the dogs, and otherwise perform wifely duties as she is clearly emotionally distressed. Toward the end of the exchange, Hillary Crowder says to her husband, Your abuse is sick. He snaps at her, saying, watch it, fucking watch it. Moments later, off camera, Steven Crowder, by his admission, would lose control and scream at his pregnant wife in a threatening tone, I will fuck you up, which led his wife to flee their home. In a statement sent by Hillary Crowder's family, they say that she spent years hiding her husband's mental and emotional abuse from her family. The very next day, on April 28th, Steven responded to this article with a statement of his own. I commented on my ongoing divorce on Tuesday, requesting privacy in the best interest of the family, but also by court order agreed upon by all parties. Look, broken marriages are ugly, and in them people do ugly things. Myself, of course included, I would never claim otherwise. However, due to recent misleadingly edited leaks to the tabloid press without context and not subject to consequences of the court, well, if not privacy, the next best option is truth. So today, I have filed a motion to officially unseal all files as they relate to the matter of legal record finances, relevant medical records, including mental health history or evaluations, depositions, and any motions or sanctions from the courts of Texas. I will not be leaking private marital information to the press, but if the privacy agreements are not respected by all parties, I will address all that is a matter of irrefutable legal record in full context next week. Yep, Stephen decided to fight against the allegations of abuse by checks notes, threatening to release his wife's medical records to the public. Very cool, very non-abusive thing to do. Now, theoretically, this could be a he said, she said kind of situation. You might be watching this video thinking, well, what if? What if Steven is right and there was some kind of deceptive editing? What if he's being falsely accused? Well, to that I say, once one allegation of abuse comes out, we often see many more follow. And when a lot of people have a story about you hurting them, it's possible that maybe you're the problem. Four days later, on May 2nd, 2023, the New York Post released an article citing allegations of abuse from Stephen's former employees. I'm not shocked, but it was pathetic what he did to Hillary, a former employee told the Post. That might not be the Stephen you see on his show, but that was the real Stephen. The Post spoke to 10 former employees who claimed Crowder ran an abusive company where he often screamed at his employees, including his own father, exposed his genitals, sent out directives to arbitrarily fire people, and made underlings wash his dirty laundry. 
The former staffers worked for the show at different times from its inception in 2016 through 2022. The vast majority had left the company voluntarily. They requested anonymity because they either feared retaliation or had signed NDAs. All said they felt compelled to speak out about the media personality after the sickening footage was made public and his former co-host Dave Lando called him a bully in an interview last week. We don't want Steven to suffer, we just want the abuse to stop, or at least let future employees know what they're getting themselves into, said one former employee. Charismatic and at times a volatile Crowder could also be controlling and capable of working every angle of your emotions. With long hours, unrealistic expectations, and emotional outbursts, he often burned through staffers, many of whom were young, starry-eyed fans who had never worked in traditional media and relocated to Texas for the opportunity to work with their hero. And while the louder with Crowder ethos was politically incorrect, his antics crossed the line. He was known to expose his genitals to staffers, many ex-employees told The Post. Six sources say they witnessed such lewd behavior firsthand. A former staffer recalled driving back from Illinois in a van after a college show in March 2018 when former producer Jaron Monroe, whom Crowder dubbed Not Gay Jared, was targeted. Jared was asleep in the last row. Steven was in front and he was joking about what he was going to do, the staffer recalled. He climbed over and dropped his junk on top of Jared's shoulder. And during a 2018 fight with six people from the company, another former employee said they witnessed Crowder put his testicles on an assistant and childhood friend John Goodman who shook off the incident. Goodman, who still works for Crowder, did not return the post request for comment. A fourth ex-employee said Crowder exposed himself to former co-host Lando at the conference table with others present. Lando did not respond to the post request for comment. It was childish, but then I found out this was something he did. At first, I took it as him trying to be friendly or one of the guys. Now I see it as a power play, the witness said. If your manager at Red Lobster did this, it would be national news. Many describe Crowder not as a tough boss, but as an unreasonable micromanager who would send out unrealistic assignments after hours and set people up for failure. It was like a cult where you were all in, said one ex-employee, adding that Crowder did not want you having a life outside of it. In 2017, he commissioned his small team to create a 30-minute A Christmas Carol parody on top of their regular workload. A few ex-employees, none of whom were paid overtime, said they logged over 100 hours in the week leading up to the release of the special and slept in the office, according to multiple sources. In the midst of this project, Crowder sent a group text message telling them to sleep in and come into the office a bit later one day. One employee remarked, sleep, lol. Crowder shot back, be a little grateful, buddy. Even before his recent divorce drama, Crowder had raised eyebrows by going after fellow conservative media titans. In January, Crowder, whose contract with The Blaze was up, launched the Stop Big Con initiative in which he accused another conservative outlet, later revealed to be Ben Shapiro's The Daily Wire, of offering him a $50 million slave contract. In March, he signed on free speech platform Rumble, and in an interview with Megyn Kelly, he said his crusade was not about me, it's about the next creator. We all laughed when he said stuff like that. If you were funny or talented, he squashed you, said a source. One one former employee said they weren't doing the sketches they wanted to do, so they teamed up with Landau to create a sketch comedy pilot released last December. Steven freaked out and threatened to fire people over it. It was viewed as a mutiny, said the ex-employee. Another source noted it was made on their own time with their own equipment and did not use company resources. Dave was told, this is your fault. We have to fire them now. Eventually, the original source said, Crowder back down. In April, Landau announced he left the company and is going to the blaze. That doesn't seem like someone who's trying to build up content creators, said the source. Many blame this public unraveling on his habit of purging anyone who challenges him. These terrible ideas and moves have always been in his nature, but over time, he has surrounded himself with only yes men and his family who works for him. They don't tell him otherwise, said an ex-staffer, adding, there is no one there to hold him to account. These are the type of stories we talk about a lot on this channel. Stories of bosses who act like they're entitled to every single part of their employees' lives. When we've covered MLM companies, when we've covered cults that form, when we've covered just bad bosses whose companies have those type of tactics involved with them, people like the Dave Ramseys of the world and things like that. It's not really a surprise to me that Steven Crowder ended up being one of those bosses and in a lot of cases being worse than a lot of those bosses, which is saying quite a lot. But it's worth repeating that every time you take a job somewhere, if you want to work in a certain career, you don't owe your entire life to that career. A boss should not be acting like they own you. They should not be treating you as if you are their property or as if your job has to be your entire life.
life and that you don't get to have your own personal identity or autonomy outside of that job. And it's a shame because a lot of the systems that Steven supports and a lot of the systems that his particular ideology supports are all about work hard at all costs. They're all about hustle culture. And when we look at it, the whole idea of purely looking at the free market as the top system above all else, that does eventually give its way to supporting hustle culture into continuing to thrive. If you want to be rich, you have to work at all costs, which leads to people like Steven Crowder being able to manipulate his employees into working for him nonstop, into swearing loyalty to him like it's a cult, things like that. So let's take a look at what's next. What is next for Steven Crowder? Will he continue to have a career after this? Part of me wants to say yes, because his audience is often made up of people who think that cancel culture is a left-wing crowd control technique. But at the same time, I really do think he's done. Because what he's done is not make one small mistake. It's that he shattered the entire image of what made people love him in the first place. Left-leaning folks have known what an asshole Steven Crowder is for a long time, but even those who agree with Steven politically have found something that they loved in him, something they could look up to. A family man who, at the end of the day, while he may be rude online for views or while his humor may be offensive to some people, he does it all for his family. To be the breadwinner for his traditional stay-at-home wife and raise his twins under the prosperity of the American dream. Right? Well, this version of Steven, the man who puts his own unborn kids in danger, that doesn't fare so well with the anti-abortion fans. The man who sexually harasses his staff isn't the hero that a crowd of purity culture embracing Christians want to follow. The man who berates his wife on camera doesn't really appeal to the nuclear family enthusiasts who loved him because they thought he was a strong, stable husband. Everything conservative audiences thought Steven Crowder was, was a lie. It was an act. They thought Steven Crowder was Jekyll, but all along he was Hyde. In a way, Steven Crowder may still be Alan the Brain, the kid who refused to turn the book to the library because he was so obsessed with the story of a man whose potions turned him evil. Let me know what you guys think about all of this in the comments below. Do you guys think Steven Crowder is going to be able to make a comeback from this, or is this the end of a longtime cyberbully? Let me know in the comments below. Other than that, I will see you guys again later this week for more videos, but in the meantime, please don't forget to support small businesses and have a fantastic start to your day. Bye! Get you some nuts! Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who.